Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 19, a psalm that will be very familiar to many of you. So Psalm 19, and we'll read the whole psalm together. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all, through all the earth, and their, world, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Uh, will you pray with me now? Lord God, we thank you that we have just read uh, that your law is perfect, uh, that your law is sure and right and true. And Father, just as you have promised it would, uh, so Father, we pray that through your word, even this evening, our uh, Lord, that you would revive our souls, that you would make wise the simple, uh, that you would enlighten the eyes and Lord, that you would rejoice the heart. And Father, we trust that through your word and by your spirit, you are able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And that Father, even in the midst of us, you are doing a work that will never pass away. So come Lord and speak and give us the ears to hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, in many ways, uh, one of the kind of laws of nature is that you can only ever know somebody uh, if there is some form of meaningful communication. So, for example, uh, I could decide as an individual uh, that I want to get to know uh, Vladimir Zelensky, right? a man we've seen on the news much these last few months, a president of Ukraine. There's a few different things that I could do. Uh, I could go on the internet and uh, stalk him on there and go onto his Wikipedia page and find out that he was uh, born Jewish and that he uh, used to work in the, uh, in the industry of comedy for some time. I could go on his Facebook page and I could scroll down and see pictures of him caring for uh, wounded soldiers in hospitals. I could go on to stuff and I could find out uh, kind of all the different political uh, realms that he's having to manoeuvre through at the moment. Uh, but if that's the extent of my knowledge of him, uh, then I can tru never truly know him. Certainly I can know bits and bobs about him, but it's not the same as knowing him. Uh, that I could talk to him all I like, I could leave messages on all his social media platforms, but actually, if he never talks back to me, uh, then we can never have a true and meaningful relationship. Now, I can never truly know him. And really, the same is true of the Lord. 
that certainly we can know bits and bobs about him, but actually we can only know God to the extent that he is willing uh, to reveal himself to us. That for us to know God and be in a meaningful relationship with him, uh, there must be two-way communication. And really that's what this psalm's all about. Now, this psalm is the beautiful reality that actually God has chosen to reveal himself to us. He's not hidden himself away. He hasn't ignored our messages, but rather he freely speaks to us, both through his world and also through his word. And so we're going to work our way down this psalm, and there's really three different sections or three different movements that happen in the psalm. The first movement is thinking about actually uh, what should we see. The second movement is thinking about what should we hear. And then the third movement is thinking about actually what should we say. And so if you glance down with me at verse 1, uh, it says there, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And the point that he's making is that actually uh, the heavens narrowly and all of creation broadly uh, is a mode of communication. That actually this physical world, it isn't just the context where you happen to live, but actually it's a theater through which God is constantly communicating himself to you. And of course, that message is the existence and the glory of God. And so if you look at verse 2, it says, Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. That actually there is not a moment of time that you are living on this world that actually the creation around you is not sending forth its message of truth. Now, whether it's through the kind of vast expanse of the blue sky or the starry hosts of the night, now the world is constantly speaking the praise of God. And it's a knowledge that's not exclusive. It's not restricted to a certain people, but rather it's a knowledge that is given to all people everywhere. And so if you look at verse 4, it says actually their words go to the end of all the earth. That actually this creation is a witness to all people without exception. I suspect that uh, most of you at some point have seen a picture or a video uh, of Times Square in New York. Maybe some of you have even been there to visit it. It's very famous. You've got the big Times Square, and then you've got <clears throat> all these huge buildings around you. And these buildings are just chock-a-block with these huge screens that are just constantly advertising TV shows and perfumes and brands and people and uh, who knows whatever else. In true metropolitan style, uh, they're on 24-7, all day and all night. These screens are constantly communicating. They're actually, if you're in Times Square, you, you can't miss it. Uh, it's right there. And according to this psalm, actually, that's what our world is. That our world is a place that is constantly communicating to us uh, all day and all night. That actually whether you see a cloudy day, whether you see a slimy worm, uh, whether you see an intricate leaf or the stunning Milky Way, uh, God is speaking to you uh, words that need to be heard. As it were, he's given you a billboard in front of you that declares at the very least God is real and this is his world. And actually, one implication of that, and the implication which Paul really draws in Romans chapter 1 that Martin read for us, is that actually because of that, that humanity is utterly without excuse uh, when they refuse to bow the knee to King Jesus. Right? Because the heavens are seen by all. They speak without ceasing. Uh, they say in the clearest words possible that actually... Man isn't the center of this world. Uh, that there is a creator who made all things and that he deserves to be worshipped. And actually part of what that means is that any understanding of this world that fails to acknowledge God 
uh, is fundamentally a false and a fallacy. Right? Any view of the world that understands it as a purely closed system is by its very nature by its very nature, inadequate. There's an old saying that I suspect many of you will have heard. And the old saying goes that when it rains in the world, it leaks in the church. And it's a very true saying, and it's certainly true in this area. That actually in universities and schools and movies and TV and the songs that we often listen to and the news that we are presented with, uh, we're taught to view this world as if there is no God and no need to God, no need for God. And actually, when you're around that constantly, when that's kind of filling your life, you often begin to think like that, even if you deny it intellectually. And some of the symptoms that actually we're beginning to think like this world is that actually how we stop being amazed by things that ought to amaze us. How we see God's beautiful world and maybe we think purely of physical laws at play. And really part of the point of this is actually as the church of Jesus Christ, how we need to relearn how to use creation. Now you might remember how the Lord Jesus used creation when he was on earth. It was quite amazing, actually, uh, that he saw a flower and he was convinced that God would protect his children. Uh, he saw a sparrow and he concluded that actually believers never need to worry in this life. You see, for Christ, it seems that actually creation was kind of a, a feast for his soul. And actually, it can be for us too. Maybe one really simple way to uh, put this into practice in your own life is that actually next time you're out in creation, uh, whether you're on a walk or going to, I don't know, walking past a beautiful bird, uh, just stopping and asking two simple questions. Uh, what does this tell me about God? And actually, how can this encourage me in my Christian life? Uh, yesterday as a family... Uh, we did that beautiful walk in the Duda National Park, uh, just past Maraitai. And it's stunningly beautiful, and you walk up on these hills, and you get this beautiful view of Maraitai, and it was stunningly beautiful. And so what does it tell me about God? Well, it tells me that actually God must be astoundingly powerful if he can create all of this. And it tells me that actually God must love beauty if he has made this world so deeply beautiful. How can that help me in my Christian life? Well, actually, if God's powerful to create all of that, then maybe he's powerful enough to help me with this sin that I'm struggling with. And if God cares enough about beauty to make this world beautiful, then maybe actually he's working my life into something of great beauty, even if I struggle to see it at the moment. So what should we see? are the glory of God inscribed on his creation. And the second thing we learn in this psalm, in verses 7 downward, is what should we hear? If you look down at verse 7 onward, uh, David goes on to speak about the law of God. And by the law, we shouldn't hear rules, but rather kind of all of the scriptures that David had in his day. And the psalm places scripture and creation are side by side in the psalm. And the connection is that they both bear witness to God. That actually they're two volumes of the same book. Now they're two rooms of the same house. And if you look down at these verses, there's a, there's a few things that are worth noticing. And the first is that actually if you look at verse 7 downward... The focus isn't actually that the scriptures say something, but that the scriptures do something. Uh, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, making wise the simple. Uh, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes. And so God's word is not merely a tool of communication, 
but actually it's a tool of transformation. It doesn't just teach you about God, but it transforms you into the image of God. Actually, according to God's word here, God's word is his power at work in your life. And alongside this focus on what the scriptures do, we've got all these descriptive words to describe God's law. And so if you look down, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the law is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. And the point is that actually God's word transforms us because of what it is. Because actually this isn't just another book from antiquity. And it isn't just another religious text like the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita. Now, it isn't just a historical record, but actually it's the living words of God which bear his seal of authority. You see, you can t- trust the scriptures as you trust God himself. And actually that's why as churches and as Christians, uh, it's so deeply important that we have a right view of God's word. It's why as Protestant churches, we've fought again and again and again to say actually that this is a divine document, that this is infallible and without error. And the reason we fight for this because, is because we believe this is the tool that God's given us to transform our very lives, and that actually there are deep moral implications to viewing the scriptures with skepticism. And so while the heavens bring information, God's word brings transformation. And kind of the way that that works is as you regularly digest God's word in your life, uh, you slowly learn to see this world from a different perspective and to respond in new ways to different situations. And it seems, and you've probably noticed, uh, that we often particularly see this in times of trial, kind of times when the rubber hits the road. When we used to live in Dunedin, there was this uh, lovely, uh, older, godly lady uh, in our congregation there. And she had been uh, a person like this, a person who had very much devoted herself to the Scriptures day in and day out for years. And over time, uh, her husband grew weaker and weaker. They were both getting on in years, and she used to tell me that she would have to wake up in the night sometimes uh, just to see if her husband was still breathing. Can you imagine what that would be like? Maybe some watching can imagine that. A little bit later on, uh, her husband had to go into a home, and he had to stay there for a year or a bit longer because she just couldn't support him and, and do everything for him that she needed. And his health just declined and declined and declined. Uh, And eventually he passed away to be with his father in glory. But what was really striking is that actually through every step of this journey, uh, I was meeting up with this woman and reading the scriptures with her, and she would tell me every time about God's faithfulness. Every time she would tell me, God is so good. I've been thinking about these promises and they've given me great hope. It didn't mean there weren't tears, it didn't mean it wasn't hard, but actually over time God's word had transformed her into this beautiful picture of Christian hope. The old Anglican bishop, J.C. Ryle, described it as being a little bit like the grass that grows, that you look at the grass one day and you look at the grass the next day and it doesn't look like anything's changed. But actually, slowly and imperceptibly, as the dew falls and the sun shines, how the grass grows and a field emerges. And that actually, the point being that actually your personal Bible reading may be doing far more for your soul than you realize. If you look down at verses 10 and 11, it gives us two kind of word pictures which describe God's word there. Uh, That they, that is God's word, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, 
sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And at the time this was written, gold was the most precious of materials, and honey was the sweetest of foods. And the psalmist is saying that actually this book is somehow more valuable than any amount of money in the world. How somehow this book is more precious and more sweet and able to provide you with a deeper level of satisfaction than even the most delicious foods of the day. And so maybe the challenge becomes, actually, have you tasted of God's word like that? Is that something that resonates with your experience? Do you know what it is to have your heart revived by God's word as you go through difficult times? Have you known what it is for actually God's word to be sweeter than honey, more precious than riches? And if so, be encouraged. Praise God for the work of his spirit and keep digesting of it. But maybe some of you haven't. Maybe actually in your heart of hearts, you've actually always found this a fairly boring book, a fairly dull book that's hard to read and feels quite removed from your own life. And if so, then these verses are an invitation to you, an invitation that God's word is so much more than you have ever thought, an invitation to come and feast upon it, begging for the ministry of his Holy Spirit, begging that you would taste and see that the Lord is good. So what should we hear? Are the life-transforming words of God. Which leads to the final thing we see in these verses, in the short psalm, uh, which is actually, what should we say? So how are we to respond to this? What do you say when God's given the entire universe as a theater to display his glory and given you his very own words to transform your life? Well, according to this psalm, you say, verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. You see, you see, the two previous sections of the psalm uh, have these implied questions in them. That actually, if the heavens de- de- uh, declare God's glory, then how much are we seeing? And actually, if God's word transforms our life uh, through his word, then actually, how much are our lives being transformed? You see, if the psalm stopped here, Uh, In verse 11, uh, it would effectively leave us hopeless and guilty. Because I know without a doubt uh, that actually not a single person in this room has ever appreciated creation as much as they should. I know without a shadow of a doubt that there is not a person in this room that has ever had their life transformed by God's word as consistently as they should. You see, God's communicated himself to us, but actually our response is often half-hearted at best. You see, God's truth leads us to see our need for God's grace. And so if you look over verses 12 and 13, uh, he goes on to lament hidden sin and then prays about kind of willful or deliberate sin. And the reason he does this is because the scope of God's witness highlights the scope of our own depravity. You see, if a man can't hear somebody whispering, we don't conclude he's deaf. But if he's in a concert and the speakers are booming and he can't hear a word, then he's deaf and probably stone deaf. And if a woman looks at a far-off hill and she can't quite discern all the features, uh, then perhaps she has slightly impaired vision. But if she's walking through Times Square and she can't see those big billboards, uh, then she's blind as a bat. And it's a little bit like that here in this psalm. That actually, if God had kind of hidden cryptic clues about himself throughout this world, 
and we hadn't, couldn't find them, then we might conclude, well, maybe we're just a bit slow. Maybe we're just not the sharpest tool in the shed. But actually, if God's given his entire creation to be a witness to himself, if God's spoken personally and authoritatively in a book that we can pick up whenever we want and we still don't come to him, then actually how great must our blindness and hardness of heart be? You see, before you become a Christian, are we completely blind? And we've got hearts that actually resolutely refuse to acknowledge God and his ways. You see, as human beings, we need not only communication, but salvation. Not only revelation, but redemption. You see, you can give a blind man a book, and you can show him a beautiful painting, but actually, unless his blindness is removed, uh, he can't understand a word. And so we're left exactly where the psalm ends. In the very last line of the psalm, if you take a look, it says, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, our need drives us to Jesus, uh, the one who not only reveals but redeems. And we are pushed towards Jesus because actually he's the only conduit of God's grace, the only one who can make the blind see are the only one where sin is authentically forgiven. And so actually in Christ, God's communication through this world and through his word is no longer merely a blanket condemnation for the Christian, but instead it becomes an invitation to get to know God. That actually because of Christ, you can look at the heavens and rejoice in the glory of God. Because of Christ, You can come to God's word and be beautifully transformed into his image. That because of Christ, you can live a life where every glance at the heavens is a strengthening of hope and where every page of the scriptures is part of a journey to change. So what should we say? God have mercy on us. A couple of years ago now in Canada, I believe, there was a man who had been blind for 68 years. And the technology uh, finally advanced to the point that they could do the necessary operation uh, upon his eyes. And they did this operation, and for the first time in almost 70 years, uh, this man could suddenly see. And reportedly, the words that he said was, I find everything beautiful. And Christian, God's opened your eyes, and everything is beautiful. And the great God of heaven has revealed himself to you so that you would know him and love him and enter a deep and meaningful relationship with him. So look at the world, treasure creation, study the scriptures, learn to cherish it, and all because of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we know that we have but a dim inkling of just what you have done for us in Jesus. Uh, Lord, we don't understand the full depth of our sin, nor do we understand the astounding work in us that you have done by your Holy Spirit. And yet we thank you for it with all of our hearts. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy upon broken sinners. Thank you for your creation which reveals your glory. And thank you for your word which transforms our lives. Our Lord, teach us to live uh, with our eyes fixed upon you. Thank you that you have redeemed us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.